All right, greetings from the Spokesman Review Media Suite, and welcome to the return of the Press Box, the Spokesman Review Sports Podcast. My name is Dave Nichols, the high school sports editor and beat reporter for the Spokane Indians and the Spokane Chiefs. Uh, the previous version of this podcast was uh, a true podcast where it was Larry Weir, uh, the great Larry Weir, uh, broadcasting from the privacy of his own home. But uh, for some reason, the powers that be decided that it would be a good idea to, to uh, reinvent this thing as a video podcast. Uh, I have a face for radio, so you're stuck with it, but it won't be a half hour of me staring at the camera. Uh, I'll be joined uh, uh, by a guest here pretty soon, and every week we'll talk to a guest, and it'll be somebody from the world of uh, Spokane sports, whether it's a coach, administrator, player, or media member, and we'll talk with them about their roles and what's interesting that week in sports. Uh, my guest won't be limited to my beats, though. Uh, I'll talk with anyone with significance uh, to Spokane sports, including Gonzaga, Washington State, pro soccer, you name it. Uh, if the spokesman sports covers it, or even if we don't, it's fair game. Uh, and this won't be a traditional question and answer interview type of thing. Uh, I'll want to have more of a conversation with my guests. Hopefully, the back and forth will provide a relaxed, more interesting exchange and make for a better show. Um, this is the first time I've done this in a long time, so I expect to get better as we go along. So hopefully this week isn't too rough, but uh, um, we're going to give it a go anyway. Uh, the first few minutes of each show, uh, I'm going to talk about what's happened in the week uh, prior to the show um, and maybe a little bit about what will be coming up in the following week. Uh, it'll be my chance to highlight things that caught my eye, uh, either in the paper or maybe something that didn't make the paper or maybe just an opportunity to get something off my chest. Uh, this is an opportunity for me to be a little self-indulgent, uh, within reason, of course. Um, I don't get a whole lot of time in the paper to, uh, uh, to be opinionated or, or to carve out that type of thing. So, um, so this is an opportunity to be able to do a little bit more of that. Um, the bottom line is that we hope to make this show at least one of three things, either enlightening, educational, or entertaining. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, we'll get all three. Uh, so with that this week... Um, our guest is going to be uh, Chris Duff, who is the president of the Spokane Indians. Uh, he's going to join me here in a little bit, and we're going to talk about uh, the stadium upgrades at Avista Stadium. We'll talk about uh, the championship season for the Spokane Indians last year and just kind of catch up on things that are going on in the organization there. Uh, to start off with, though, I want to highlight a couple of things uh, from the world of high school sports that happened in the, in the previous week and kind of look ahead to where we're going. Um, it was week eight in football, uh, so there's a lot of that to talk about, but what I want to I start with uh, the, the, um, the slow pitch softball tournament that happened uh, down in Yakima. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of forget about uh, slow pitch softball happening in the fall, but, um, you know, it, it's a varsity sport just like everything else. And, um, and, and the Greater Spokane League has been uh, dominant since, the, since slow pitch um, came back to the Washington State sports. Um, they were kind of pioneers in the thing. Uh, Ken, Van Sinkle, Ken Van Sickle, uh, the former athletic director at, at University High School, kind of pioneered the return of slow pitch softball and, 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 and made it into a, a fall sport to give girls another opportunity to play a varsity sport in the fall. And in the Greater Spokane League has kind of dominated play since, that, since it was brought back 20 years ago. Uh, this past weekend, um, the GSL teams finished 1, 2, and 3 uh, in, in the 3A, 2A tournament and number two in the 4A tournament. Um, Mount Spokane beat U-High in the 3A, 2A championship, and Shadle Park won the third place game. And then uh, in 4A, um, Meade uh, made a terrific run through the tournament and ended up in second there. So uh, just a tremendous job by all the greater Spokane League teams in the, in the slow pitch softball tournament. Um, as I mentioned, football was week eight this week. Uh, the big game Friday night was uh, Gonzaga Prep against Meade out at Union Stadium. Um, just a terrific ball game, very good defensive struggle. Uh, Gonzaga Prep ended up pulling it out there at the end uh, to remain undefeated. Um, they are 8-0 heading into week nine. Um, Meade at 7-1. and, at seven and one. Uh, Obviously, these two teams will be the two representatives from uh, the, to earn the automatic bids into the round of 32 out of the four A's. Uh, Lewis and Clark will have a chance to join them um, as, the, as the number third place team in the GSL. They'll uh, get a chance to play the MCC, the Mid-Columbia Conference's uh, third place team on the Tuesday after the regular season um, to, to, in order to try to join them in the round of 32. Um, 
the, in the three A ranks. Um, we've got Central Valley that, that won again. They're at six and two in the league, and um, and and they clinched the three uh, A number one seed. So they're not, they'll, they'll go on to to play in the round of 32. Um, we've got Mount Spokane and Shadle Park tied at four and four. Um, and and this is a this is kind of a interesting story because Mount Spokane started off the season 0 and 4. Um, they they kind of had a front loaded schedule where they played uh, G Prep and Mead and 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 CV early on in the schedule and uh, kind of took their lumps as they were re- replacing their quarterback, their running back, and their wide receiver from last year, all all league performers. Um, but they've bounced back to to win four in a row, so now they sit a game out of the playoffs. Uh, the thing here is that Mount Spokane has to be a game clear of Shadle Park because Shadle beat them early in the year. So, um, so it, it, both teams have uh, huge games coming up in Week Nine. So we're going to take a break for just a second, and we will be joined by Chris Duff of the Spokane Indians uh, when we return. So thank you. All right, welcome back to the Spokesman Review Media Suite. Uh, this is the second portion of this Press Box po- podcast. My name is Dave Nichols, and I'm joined now by. Spokane Indians president, uh, Chris Duff. Chris, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Awesome. No, I appreciate you having me, Dave, and it's an awesome big guest on the show. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, um, I wanted to keep this conversational. This isn't going to be a traditional question and answer type of thing, but uh, um, there are some things specifically that we want to get into. And uh, Do you want to talk about uh, the championship first, or do you want to talk about the stadium? Uh, let's go championship. That yeah, that's that's exciting. And in a, in a you have a question you want to ask, you want me to just go. No, just go. Yeah, no, it was awesome. Just a great year, obviously. Um, you know, we look at it from a business standpoint. You know, we always target that two hundred fifty thousand mark um, from an attendance uh, number that we really try to get to each year, and we hit that uh, during the regular season. And then we we're fortunate enough to make the playoffs. Um, you know, making the playoffs in the first half really helps out. Just knowing what you're doing at the end of the year too, just getting flights right. for guys and different things. Uh, but we were, I mean, best team from beginning to end this year. Great roster. Even we had a couple guys called up that were key pieces. You know, the Rockies were able to backfill some um, and really add some nice pieces uh, to make that championship run. And uh, we were fortunate enough to win at home in Spokane. Uh, but we had uh, Gonzaga as a great partner. Uh, we had a lot of, you know, stadium work that we were you know, starting right after the regular season. But uh, Gonzaga was a gracious host and allowed us to play a couple games over there, and then uh, uh, we had the chance to win that championship on their field in front of our home crowd, which was just awesome to do. How weird was that? You know, spend the whole season at Avista Stadium and then play in the championship series. I guess you're fortunate enough that you get to play it in Spokane because there was a possibility that, that because Avista Stadium wasn't available, you could have had to play it in Vancouver. Absolutely. No, it was touch and go. I mean, we really didn't know truly where we were going to be hosting those games until you know a week or so out. Um, you know, we had this plan in place for a couple of years. We knew we were going to be doing field renovations directly after the 24 season, um, but we didn't have approval from Major League Baseball until just a few days in advance of playing at Gonzaga. So uh, we had to make some uh, backup plans to playing Vancouver, mm-hmm. um, potentially play at an alternate site in the Northwest League as well. But fortunately, we were able to play at Gonzaga, and it was it was a great experience. It's a nice size venue uh, for the championship series. It holds about 13, 1,400 people, which we put in there both nights. Um, but it's interesting. You know, it is our home field, but we're having to move our entire operation over there you right. know, from a promotion standpoint and, you know, all the baseball operations stuff, too. And, again, Gonzaga was just an awesome host, and um, they were very flexible with some of their spaces over in McCarthy as well that we had to utilize for clubhouse spaces. Um, but it was weird for mm-hmm. sure right. um, you know we were home but not home uh, wearing our home uniforms but not necessarily at our stadium you know everything felt a little bit off um, you know just BP times were a little bit different um, any Audi was a little bit different the game flow was different the scoreboards in a different location mm-hmm. the pitch clock is a little different the, the so. press box doesn't bounce up and down yeah the press box doesn't move so yeah you, you don't get the vibration during the game so just not like a Vista Stadium but it was awesome. Uh, just great experience um, and just really fun to see the guys win it. And you know, talking to guys like Kyle Karos that went through that process, you know, for the first time and just the difference he felt with playoff baseball versus that regular season where mm-hmm. he was like, every pitch matters and like every pitch should matter in the regular season too. But it's just, you know, it's a different game in the yeah. playoffs. And um, it was really neat to be able to do it in Spokane in front of our fans, as you said, and um, just to work with Gonzaga as an awesome host. Eerie, but super cool to do. Right. Um, you mentioned uh, the, some of the players in and out, and I think maybe casual fans might not understand that that you have no control over the roster, right? It's not like the Chiefs where, you know, the Chiefs 
are the ones that are going out and getting the talent and, 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 and they're part of the Chiefs organization. These players are from the Rockies organization. They aren't Indians organization. So you have no control over the roster from day to day. That's, that's kind of be, uh, that's got to be uh, um, weird, exhilarating, frustrating, all the above. Absolutely. Everything you just said. And it's a, uh, you know, in a year like 2024, we won the championship. We'll absolutely take credit for, you know, what the guys did on the field. But right. you're correct in that um, we basically own a, a entertainment business. You know, so uh, my wife loves to remind me she's in the medical industry and she likes to remind me that my business is mascots and hot dogs. Um, so that's really what we do. You know, we <laughs> right. sell tickets. We make sure that we have fans coming out, having a great time. And our business model is to lose every game. If we lose every game, but fans still have a great time, and they continue coming back. We've done our job. Um, however, when the team does well, obviously that positively impacts business also. And right. you know, we're part of the system where we're developing players and we're helping the Rockies develop future major leaguers as well. So you know, that part really matters and that experience the players have at the stadium. But you know, it is you know challenging when you have a guy like Dolander that had a great year and you know, right when we're kind of in that, the thick of it, we won the first half. Um, but we're moving towards a playoff run, you know, he gets called up. And mm-hmm. it's great for him. You're excited for him. But at the same time, you're like, God, that's our guy. You know, right. and he's been in our uniform. And while he's not a Spokane Indians employee, he's in our uniform. Right. Um, so he's representing us on the field and in the community. Um, so it is this kind of love-hate relationship of you really want the guys to do well and move up and, you know, get better in, in their careers. Um, but you also know in the back of your mind if, you know, I was surprised Caro stayed, you know, right. the entire year that, you know, a guy has a year like that. Like, are they going to make it through the entire year? So it's awesome to see. But at the same time, it's challenging because you don't control it. So we really focus our business on what we can control. And that's those mascots and those hot dogs. Right. It's um, you look at the roster as the season goes on and you're like, OK, this guy's going to go up and this guy's going to go up. But the, the uh, this year, the Indians were really lucky to have that that core, like you mentioned, Eric Car- or Kyle Karras. And mm-hmm. I haven't referred to him as Eric <laughs> since the opening day. Uh, Kyle Karras and, and Cole Carrig, um, those guys were with the team all, all season long and really kind of formed that championship nucleus. That absolutely, that was that was the core group there. And, you know, was the heart of the order for sure. Those are the guys getting on base all year long. Uh, they're pumping each other up and, um, you know, Kyle and Cole had a you know really strong relationship. You know, between the two of them too, they challenged each other. You know, you saw that multiple times mm-hmm. throughout the year. Um, you know, the Rockies have done a good job of. You know, they've bumped some guys up fairly quick, but some of those core nucleus guys, like we just talked about, you know, they've left in places because they want to develop not only that uh, player development system where the guys are moving up and they're getting better and they're challenging themselves, but they also want to win. You know, that's part of what they're trying to build from a culture standpoint. So, they see these key pieces like the Karos and the Carrig. Um, and they kept him there. And I was really surprised, to be honest with you, that, you know, when you see uh, Charlie Condon come up, you know, I, I, I personally thought he was going to slide in the third base role and you're going to see Karos move up because he definitely earned that. Right. Uh, but they wanted to keep that nucleus together. And that was important. Um, and ultimately, that's what led to a championship. So good for us. Right. Uh, good. Absolutely. Great for Spokane. Great for Spokane. Great for the Indians. Great for the organization. Um, the Rockies seem like they are um, – making a concentrated effort to move guys up as quickly as they feel that that player is ready, right? It's not where they have to toil in low A and then toil in high A and then toil in double A. If, if this player shows an aptitude, it seems like they're really moving them up quickly. And we see that now. The Rockies uh, roster is littered with guys that, that played in Spokane two years ago, a year and a half ago. You know, there's there's already, you know, half a dozen guys that were key to the Indians team, you know, just two summers ago. Yeah, it's really awesome to see. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a couple different things. It's the Rockies organization, one, as a whole, and you know, just where they've been drafting, they've had some higher prospects um, that they've been able to aggressively push through the system. Mm-hmm. And the Rockies have, have shown a, a nature for mm-hmm. you know, if a guy, if they feel like a guy is ready and they, they want to challenge him, they're going to move him up. Um, but at the same time, too, that move from short season, where we were in 2019, to high A, mm-hmm. uh, where we started in 2021, uh, we are a couple steps closer to the majors as well. And I, I did not anticipate seeing guys from the Spoken Indians roster on a major league roster you know, the next year, mm-hmm. or even at the end of that year, um, as much as we have seen these last couple of years. But it's been really cool to see that you know, a lot of guys have come through our system played in Spokane, whether it's part of a year or a full year, you know, making some impacts at the major league level, um, you know, with the Rockies. And I think we're going to see a lot more. You look through the Rockies top prospect list right Mm -hmm. now, and it's littered with Spokane Indians players that, you know, are projected to be up there in 25, 26. So I think it's going to, we're going to continue to see that. And, 
you know, you come out to Vista Stadium, you see Spokane Indians players, and you're probably going to see you know several that are going to be in the major leagues in the next couple of years. Yeah, it's not like not like previous days where there might be one or two guys that you can you know if you if you squint really tight, you see hey this guy might be a major leaguer. We're talking about first round picks, second round picks, guys that uh, that are on national top 100 lists. I mean, and, and it's been every year that that we've been involved with with the Rockies organization since um, since the switch. And I, I got to think that that some of the um, the the condensing of minor league baseball uh, in general is adding to that uh, that aspect as well as moving moving the prospects quicker. Yeah, you're you're definitely seeing um, the cream of the crop. I mean, the, these are the best athletes. These are the best baseball players in the world that are now in the minor league system. And you know, there's 25 percent roughly of the industry that was eliminated. And some of these guys are still playing baseball. They're playing independent ball. But mm-hmm. um, you're really seeing the prospects in the minor league system now. Uh, when you had 25 or 30 man rosters in the past, I mean, there was a handful of guys you know never had a chance, right. um, but they needed them to fill out a roster. Um, and those guys, they still have jobs. They're not in my affiliated minor league ball anymore. They're probably in independent ball. But these are truly prospects that you're seeing night in, night out, um, all throughout the minor league system. And then especially you know with that move from short season to high A at a Vista Stadium and in Spokane, we're seeing it a lot more. Yeah, it's kind of a. Um um, kind of an amalgamation of all the good things that, that minor league baseball can be is, is happening to the Indians. You know, right, the moving up a, le- a level, the condensation and, and the Rockies, uh, the Rockies major league team being not so great to get high draft picks. It just, it just seems like a concentration of talent here. Absolutely. No, I, there's um, there's been some wins for Spokane, no doubt. Um, you know, when the change occurred during COVID, major league baseball made all the restructure, um, you know, there, there were – it was challenging for sure, um, but we really tried to look at it as an opportunity. We knew that going from short season to high A was going to be a positive impact to mm-hmm. um, you know, the product that we're putting on the field that our fans are seeing. It's better than I anticipated, and right. we have more guys going up quicker than I anticipated. But um, we really saw that as an opportunity, and we tried to embrace it. Um, and that's been our goal for the last three years is we know change is hard. Um, we knew that Major League Baseball had some certain goals in place, but – um, the only way we're going to be successful through that process is to embrace it, truly treat it as a partnership, and you know, really do everything we can to um, do as much as possible to make this a positive experience for the players and the fans in Spokane. Well, one of those changes that Major League Baseball, one of the biggest changes were um, the, the changes that were needed to the player, the player safety and development changes, the, um, the which spurred the stadium renovations, and now we can uh, um, kind of shift our talk into into talking about that a little bit. Um, there's a lot that has already happened. There's a lot that is going on happening right now, and a lot that could happen in the future. So let's uh, let's tight, let's break it up that way. Let's talk about what has already happened at the stadium, um, the the changes to the clubhouse and the and the uh, the workout building that that are that are completed. Let's let's talk about those first. Absolutely, it's. Uh... It's been a crazy time. I mean, it's been quite the last couple of years just going through the fundraising effort, trying really, you know, backing up, just wrapping our head around what do we need to do to a Vista Stadium in order to get it compliant with right. the Major League Baseball facility. And how are we going to pay for it? Yeah, and how are we going to pay for it? Um, you know, luckily we have some great partners. You know, Spokane County owns a facility. Um, you know, they were very receptive uh, to what the needs were from early on. Um, you know, they didn't write a check for $22 million day one, but uh, they were open to having conversations and really understanding what the needs are. Why are we doing what we're doing? What's the economic impact? Right. You know, what does this mean to the community to have this asset that's been around since 1903? And, you know, it took some education, but we got there for sure. Uh, the city of Spoken Valley, uh, same thing, uh, great partner, really listened from day one, and they were actually the first dollar in uh, to this entire project. And we we're also fortunate enough to work with the state of Washington um, so we have multiple government entities coming together, mm-hmm. you know, pulling in the same direction, which is hard to do. Right. And then you have a private business that we also stepped up and we've contributed, um, you know, multiple millions of dollars to the project as well. So to date, uh, we have about eighteen and a half million dollars that we have put into the stadium and are currently in the process of putting into the stadium, and that has covered up to this point. Uh, we renovated the first base clubhouse building the third base clubhouse building and expanded both buildings. We flipped the Spoken Indians from the home side to the third base side. Uh, We also put in new LED lighting prior to the 2024 season. And then um, we added a batter's eye. A batter's eye was a big piece that Major League Baseball needed. And we Mm -hmm. actually combined a grounds crew building with the batter's eye. So all four of those projects, the two clubhouse buildings, the field lights, the batter's eye slash grounds crew building were complete prior to the 2024 season. 
um, during the 25 or sorry the 24 season uh, early on kind of late April early May we also broke ground on a strength and conditioning facility that is in the left field corner uh, directly adjacent to that third base clubhouse building where the Indians are now housed and uh, I'm happy to say that building has come along very nicely uh, I was just in there just a few minutes right before <laughs> I came down and uh, it looks great and uh, we're anticipating getting occupancy there in the next two to three weeks um, which will really add to the player development experience also give us an opportunity to program the facility and some of the indoor spaces not only when the team's on the road during the baseball season but also we're looking to do that in the off season as well just trying to drive as much traffic as possible to sure. the stadium and the fair and expo center um, we're also right now uh, probably the most visual renovation we've done to the facility in the history since 1958 um, we're expanding the dugouts. We just finished laying the sod for a brand new field as well. Uh, we're in the process of putting up foul pole, or sorry, netting from foul pole to foul pole, so spectator netting to protect from line drives. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow at one o'clock, we're opening the bids for a video board. So we are fairly confident. We have <laughs> a really good project that we're excited to tell everybody about here in the coming weeks. Uh, but we are anticipating having a video board in place uh, prior to the 2025 season. So um, lots has ha has happened, uh, lots uh, are happening, and then we've got some other plans for the future as well. So you mentioned you, you glossed over the expansion of the dugouts, but uh, but it's more than just making them bigger. It's doubling their size, and and you can explain a little bit more technically, but because of the the permanent wall that separates the field from the stands you're having to expand into the field of play. Talk about that a little bit. Correct. Yeah, there was a lot of back and forth on the dugouts and which way we're going to go. And um, basically, we needed to make them bigger. Mm -hmm. And we had a couple of options. We could go down the foul lines or we could go back into the seating bowl or we could go out into the field. Um, we chose ultimately to go out into the field for a couple reasons. One, through all of this, we want to make sure that the fans have as positive experience as possible. Try not to negatively impact you know, anything that we can. So there's sight line issues as right. you go back in, as you go down the line, you're taking seats away, which, you know, as we look at who has those seats, you're like, oh, these people have had them for 30 something <laughs> years, and, you know, passed them down from generations. And right. we just can't take those from people. Um, and if we were to go back into the seating bowl, uh, the back of the dugout wall actually acts as a retaining wall for the entire, entire seating area above it. <laughs> so if you take that wall out to try and expand it, then you're right. rebuilding the entire seating bowl behind it. So you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. I don't think most people realize that the seating area at Avista Stadium is just built on a hill of dirt. It, literally a dirt mound. Yeah. yeah, it was built in 1958. Do you know how many, day, how many days did I ask you this question before? No. 61 working days is how long to it build took a Vista Stadium. to build a Vista Stadium in 1958. So That's it's, kind of ridiculous. It's crazy. Yeah, it's literally a dirt mound with... Uh, grade beams sat on top, some weld plates. Those precast risers originally in 1958, um, but then in the last, it's probably been 12, 14 years now, um, they're poured in place concrete, so it's not going anywhere. Right. Uh, but it yeah, sounds it's, like things are going to shift. No, if they're an not. Earthquake. No, they're not shifting. They're not going anywhere. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of concrete in that stadium now. But yeah, just in order to expand those dugouts, you know, inward into the seating bowl, it was just going to be a massive mm -hmm. project that we'd end up pouring the same concrete back, getting the same seats, actually a few less seats, so it negatively impact the fans, mm -hmm. cost a lot more money, and you're really not gaining anything. So right. we actually pushed out about 40 inches into the field. Um, so with that footprint, you're correct, it more than doubles the the overall square footage of the dugout. So we'll we'll end up with you know, higher seating in the front with the guardrail that the guys are leaning on, just like mm -hmm. in the World Series tonight. You'll see the guys leaning on right. the guardrail uh, and then some seating in the back as well. Uh, and it's uh, in the MLB requirements. You're required to have 45 lineal feet of seating, and I think we're going to end up with like 56 or 57. So everything we've done through this process too is that you know we've definitely looked at the major league standards and we have not met the minimums. Uh, where we could, we have either done a little bit more square footage or where there's a requirement for one women's facility, we've done three women's facilities. Right. So we're really trying to think of not only 2025, 2026, what do we anticipate Major League Baseball requiring, but where's the game going? Right. Where Where's our business going? So we've tried to expand where we can and really do 110% instead of 100% of what Major League Baseball is requiring. Well, and as far as the dugouts go, you had that space available to you in the field of play. The Vista Stadium's got more foul territory than any other ballpark in the Northwest League. So that was... Maybe in minor league baseball. Well, there yeah, you yeah. go. I was, I was being polite. Yeah. Um, you had the space to work with. Yep. 
Absolutely. No, we did. And I, I know that space drives you nuts too, Dave. But <laughs> it yeah. kind of does. Yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely have plenty of room out there. And, it, you know, it is still minor league baseball. And um, even though we're the only team currently that doesn't have a video board, but we hope to have one by opening day of 2025, um, we're always going to do little skits on the field. Mm-hmm. You know, we're always going to have the kids out there doing the dizzy bat races or the pizza box toss or right. whatever it ends up being. And that buffer from the dugout to that foul line really creates a nice safe space for those activities yeah. to occur it's, so it's your stage yeah you're it, in the it, entertainment business it, that's your stage it really is so we like some foul territory um i still would take a little bit less um but we've got a nice stage that we can use on both the third and first base side um even with the expansion out into the field with mm-hmm. the dugouts um Another aspect of what's going on currently is uh, you mentioned resodding, but in order to lay down fresh sod, you had to completely rebuild the field of play. And I think most people didn't realize just how much the field sloped in the outfield. I mean, there was like, hey, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like a, almost a three foot drop from second base to the wall in center field. Talk a little bit about the resurfacing and, and doing that doing yeah. that for the field. Yeah, it's amazing. Everybody comes out to the stadium and um, you know, it looks great. You sit in stands and you have your hot dog and, you know, you watch the kids on the stage and you you watch the baseball game. And, um, you know, it, it always has been really pleasing to the eye. We've won multiple field of the year in the Northwest mm-hmm. League. We've won it on a national level. But then when you really start looking closely and you start walking the field and shooting lasers, like, holy cow, this thing is not <laughs> level. Right. Um, yeah. So there was a 30 inch drop from second base to the center field wall and also from the left field foul line and right field foul line towards center field as right, well. So it so, all came in. So yeah. in, you see a lot of crowned fields, you know, back in the day, that's how they built fields, but we were actually the other way, you know, <laughs> we were inversely crowned. Um, so yeah, there was a 30 inch drop there. So it was so a big it, drainage ditch. Totally. That's what it was in center field. Yeah, so no, no wonder the, the previous, before you, this is the second renovation of the field in the last few years. Correct. The first one, we, we kind of mm-hmm. joked about there being Lake Spokane or mm-hmm. Lake Vista Field because it, it literally sloped into the center and then away. So water would congregate there like behind second base. That doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't. And you knew you had a problem when you saw ducks on the field. Right. Like there, there were times <laughs> when we'd come in after a race, we're like, oh, no, there's ducks on the field again. You know, that's not good. Um but yeah, no. It's in order to do what we needed to um, to accomplish for the major league baseball requirements. We had to go down, you know, anywhere from two feet to three feet in different locations throughout mm-hmm. uh, the field. And you know, the the original field was built on native soil in 1958, and it has been renovated a couple of times throughout its history. And when we did the last renovation that you referenced two years ago, three years ago, we went down six to eight inches. Mm-hmm. So we kind of got that top layer off. But uh, this time we went down two to three feet, you know, depending on where you were. And we have put in all new drainage fields. There's six inches of gravel, a foot of sand, then all the irrigation. So it's all new irrigation, all new drainage. So you'll come out, you'll notice the field looks great, mm-hmm. just like it did in September. Right. Uh, it looks great again today. You know, the brand new sod is down. Uh, what you don't see underneath is all of the drainage, all the irrigation, all of this, the base layer uh, that's been put in. Um, and all of that allows for proper drainage. And it's really challenging the spring games. You know, in the summer, it doesn't rain a ton. Mm-hmm. And it's hot. And it's right. it dries fairly quickly. But in April, when it rains, the rain and the water doesn't go anywhere very quickly. So right. that drainage is really important for this long season and those spring games as well. Um, you'll notice it's flatter. For sure. Yeah. Like, it'll catch your eye and be like, something looks different, but the average fan won't quite be able to put it together. But Well, when I was out there last week, that's the first thing. That, it's crazy. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's just how much flatter it is. I mean, yeah. you can notice it. Yeah. No, it, it's really neat. And you can really notice it. The, the comparable for me is the outfield wall. When mm-hmm. you look at the signs on the outfield wall and you look at the bottom of those signs and you saw the field in its old form sloping away in center field from those signs and you know where you had a gap of a couple inches in left and right field and you have a gap of you know right. two and a half feet in center field like what well, something's going on there but uh, it's going to be a nice clean look throughout the field and one thing i didn't mention also as part of this field project uh, is we'll be doing all new padding as well so the right. outfield wall that's been hand painted for over 30 years mm-hmm. uh, this will be the first year that we're actually going to have some vinyl on those outfield walls that's um that might be a small thing, but it it's kind of a, the end of a tradition, right? Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And we've been really intentional and careful with everything we've done um, 
you know, it is a 1958 stadium. It's always going to feel that way. Mm-hmm. It's always going to have the, you know, the Dodgers bars and the lower box seats. We purposefully put those back when we did the concrete innervation as well. Uh, we think it just fits kind of part of the charm. Yeah, it's just it, it is what it is. And, and we want to embrace it. We're not trying to avoid it. Um, so we've been hand painting our signs for over 30 years and we kind of pushed off this padding project for mm-hmm. an extra year to give Ruben, our sign painter, great guy. Um, we gave him another season of, of painting those signs too, and, and gave him a proper send off as well. But yeah, you're right. It's the end of an era of no video board and, and hand painted, you know, right. outfield signs. Right. Uh, and we're, yeah, we're getting into the 20th century, I guess. One last question about the field. Um, was there any, uh, uh, finger crossing, hold your breath type of thing, having to dig so far down and the worry of, you know, what happens if we find a native artifact, you know, that type of thing. Was there that kind of con- concern? Yeah, there, there definitely is. And, you know, obviously we have a very close partnership with the Spoken Tribe and, um, you know, they were involved in that project too. And mm-hmm. they, um, you know, offered to be a consultant through that process as well. So, yeah, it's, it's always on your mind. And, you know, we've got some contingency dollars. Anytime you go into a project, you have those dollars. And, you know, if we were going to spend those, it was probably going to be when we went down and maybe does it pause the project mm-hmm. and then you got to work more shifts. But once you get down and you start coming back up, you feel a little bit more comfortable with the dollars. But yeah, as you're excavating and, mm-hmm. and kind of tearing those things out. You never know what you're going to find. No, and but we were kind of looking out of, you know, two different eyes. You're One, you're watching the field and watching the excavation, but the other eye, we were at Gonzaga at the time. We were right. playing a championship series too, so you're kind right. of bouncing back and forth and like, oh God, I hope we don't find anything and hope mm-hmm. everything goes smooth. And then we're trying to prepare for a championship too. So Lots it was a fun time. Fire. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Um, so you've mentioned it a couple times. Let's get to it. Let's talk about this video scoreboard that's uh, that's planned to go above the left field wall. Talk about what you want. Talk about what you think it might end up. You know, let's 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 get into some of the. I know that, that you don't want to announce it until you've got until it's in place. But let's talk about a wish list. Sure. No, absolutely. And uh, so again, tomorrow is the bid opening. So one o'clock tomorrow, we'll find out you know where we stand. Mm-hmm. Probably be making decisions. You know, we've got a group with the county. Uh, we have an owner's rep as well. It'll be part of that process. Architect will be involved. General contractor. I noticed um, the media was left out of that. Yeah, process. no, no, Dave, you don't get. Yeah, you don't get a say in this one. <laughs> I've been uh, trying to insinuate myself into all of this. No, I know. Well, we looked at the home plate thing, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so we actually put. Uh, we really broke it up. Um, as part of the bid process too. And, and there's a lot of different alternates. So there's different sizes that we put out there. There's different, different pixel spacing that we put out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a sound system that we put as part of the project as well. We've got some stuff going on in right field. So we really have a ton of things to choose from. But what we're anticipating seeing tomorrow is that uh, we are hoping to replace the matrix board that's currently in right field. So it's above the scoreboard mm-hmm. on the existing structure. So if you walked in today or walked in on opening day and the scoreboard is off, it'll look exactly the same. However, our hope is that that matrix one color amber display will be replaced with a video board of the same exact size. Okay. So that'll be kind of game headshot stats similar to the use that we currently right. uh, have it for right now. In addition to that, we're looking to add a brand new structure in left center field, um, four to five vertical columns, a video board anywhere from 25 by 60 to 30 by 70, somewhere in that range, which is massive. Yeah. Uh, You know, it will have a similar. Just just as a reference point, how tall is the wall there? The wall will be 13 feet tall there. So it'll be above the wall. Right. Yeah, so it's it'll be 40 to 43 feet tall. Right. uh, Above the wall, and um, which can be huge. It's going to be a huge impact. Um, you know, it's something that we're really excited about, mm-hmm. and we're, it's probably going to take us a while to learn. And we've been operating the stadium forever right. with no video board, uh, so it's going to take some time. We've got some consultants we're planning on bringing in to help us with some of that show piece, too. So we're anticipating seeing those two video components be a part of this package that we're hoping to see tomorrow and hopefully awarding in the next couple of days. Also hoping to have some new speakers, uh, new sound system Mm -hmm. that will replace some of the existing speakers that we have in place, but also with the new construction, we've kind of created some dead zones on the outer concourse just with the new building. So we've got a few um, speakers that we're looking to add on the outer concourse there as well. Uh, So it's huge. I mean, it's it's a big project for us. It's an expensive project for us, uh, but one we think is uh, really going to add to the show. It's going to add to the customer service. There's all these Mm -hmm. ancillary benefits that, you know, we don't even know of right now that are going to help our business. You know, we've operated in this old school environment for so long. Uh, We're excited to have a new toy to play with for sure. And you'll be able to show literally anything 
recorded, you can put up there ads and replays and all that sort of stuff. Correct. And we do have some obligations with our license with Major League Baseball. They have some inventory on the video board that they sell on the national level that we're obligated to play on our video board. Okay. We're currently not doing that because we don't have a video board. Right, because you don't have one. Um, but so we'll be playing ads, you know, those types of things. And it, it won't be inundated with ads. I mean, it's the, the primary purpose is going to be for the fans and spectators and to enhance that experience. But, yeah, right. we'd have the ability to, you know, show a post-game movie or do a, you know, a World Series watch party on mm-hmm. it, um, do in-game. Um, you know, you've got a fan cam, too. So you've, we're going to have some fixed cameras throughout the stadium, but also a roaming fan cam as well. So a lot more engagement right. and interaction, you know, with the fans as well. Um so yeah, there's. I mean, it's unlimited what you can do with these, and you know, just with the technology too. We had some concerns just being in left field as the sun sets. You know, it's really kind of hammering that board oh, yeah. on the left field side. But uh, we've been assured, and we've you know taken a look at a few different projects where it is in this, a similar situation to what we're in, and you can turn up and down the brightness and all things that we have we know nothing about. Right. We've never dealt with it, but. Um, yeah, we're we're pretty excited about this project. Well, that's a good tie-in with the uh, with the LED lights and fitting the stadium for um, for broadcast and, mm-hmm. and not broadcast broadcast, but but streaming the, the the games that you were able to do for the first time last year, and that was a little bit of a of a growth project too. It was a lot better at the end of the season than it was when you put it in, but um, just more towards the modernization of minor league baseball professionalism. Yeah. You you used that word the other day. We were go. together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. And we're hoping to be able to utilize the company that we're doing some of the streaming with. Um, we pieced that together a year in advance. We were hoping that project was actually going to go in conjunction with the video board because mm-hmm. there's some synergies there. Um, so we're probably going to end up using that company that's doing the streaming to do some of our video stuff with the video board as well. Uh, but we really kind of put it together at the last minute for 2024, the streaming mm-hmm. um, piece. And you're correct. It it started off a little rocky. We got a little bit better at the end of the year. But, um, you know, Major League Baseball felt it was very important for us, us being the full 120, to get it in place mm-hmm. for 24 as a trial run, really, if nothing else. And they're expecting to see quite a bit of a quality increase in 2025, as are we. And we'll be streaming across the full 120, and that's a, a piece of inventory that Major League Baseball is pretty excited just to expand the brand, right. um, really highlight more of the prospects, and you know, draw more eyeballs to the game right. of baseball. Well, as a as a heavy end user, um, I really appreciated it. It was great to be able to follow the team for all of the road games. You know, because I, you know, our, our write ups for the road games obviously are a lot shorter and less detailed than than the home games because I'm there for the home games. But being able to see the games on the road now, um, being able to look at the replays from the home games, it may, it, it helps uh, it's it helps me cover the team in a little bit more uh, detail where some of that was missing in the past where you would get two sentences in the write-up the next day. No, absolutely, and we appreciate everything you do. So, yeah, anytime we can get a write-up, you know, we really love to see it in the spokesman. So, um, you know, it's – for us, too, we find ourselves, even when we're not home and we're on the road, we'll watch some of our game. But during the commercial break, we might flip to another game, too. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of neat to just flip through. There's 60 broadcasts going right. on at any one time. You and can just, look at Hartford and yeah, see the guys that it, were playing here last it's week. It's really cool, yeah. yeah. You know, what, what are our guys doing from last year? Um, so it's it's I think it's doing what Major League Baseball wants it to do, and it's just – you know, it's grabbing those eyeballs and you know, you've got a captive audience that, you know, they may not watch, you know, three hours of one specific game, mm-hmm. but, you know, they're flipping through and, and seeing a few different broadcasts. So I, I think it's a really cool idea and one that, you know, we've embraced and we're excited to be a part of moving forward. Well, as long as we can get a, a, a working radar gun on one of the scoreboards, I'll be happy. Oh, I didn't mention, Dave. I know that that would get you excited, too. But in addition to the video board above the existing scoreboard, there w- will be a minimum refurbishment of the existing scoreboard. So um, there's a potential, depending on it's an alternate again, that we may replace the scoreboard. It'll be the same size. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're we're guaranteeing it's coming with a, a working radar <laughs> gun. So it works sometimes. Was uh, Is there anything that I didn't ask about that you want to mention? Uh, on the construction or just, just in, in life general, in general? Yeah. Um, there doesn't have to be. I know, but there's more. There's always something going on, right? I know, there's always something going on. Um, I mean, I could go a bunch of different directions, but yeah. You guys no. got some good merchandise for the the Northwest League uh, Championship stuff. We do, yeah. We, we did end up doing some merchandise there. Um, we weren't, we actually have 
have had quite a bit more demand than we anticipated. Oh, yeah? So we did an order, and we're like, oh, well, that's gone. So we well, had to I'm do glad, another. I'm glad I got yeah. mine when I could. Yeah. So there, there's some more coming, but, you know, we got some good merchandise in for that, too. What's uh, What's been the relationship with the Rockies in general? Uh, new and different, for sure. I mean, when you're coming off of a 16-year partnership with the Texas Rangers, um, you know, it and the difference, too, was that we had such a choice in the past. Mm-hmm. Like, we, there was, like, a process that you go through, and we felt like we had a little bit of – we, the minor league side, had a little bit of leverage as well, um, where this one is an arranged marriage. I mean, right. we were assigned the Colorado Rockies. It made sense from a geographic standpoint. You know, that's part of what Major League Baseball is trying to accomplish, you know, with some of the restructure as well, was just to tie some of those brands in more regionally. And um, – we met the Rockies basically during COVID. So, mm-hmm. I mean, for the first several months, you know, you weren't shaking hands. You were seeing each other on the screen. So that was tough to start a relationship that way. And then that 2021 season, you know, there was the social distancing of even the players and the dugouts. And, like, it it was just a really awkward time. So right. I kind of throw out 21 and then look at 22 and beyond. And it's been really good. Um, their communication has been strong. I think that our um, – you know, the cultures align, you know, the, the Rockies have a, a family feel to their front office. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have been around a long time and their leadership very similar to us. I mean, we've got multiple, you know, people in our leadership that have been around for 20 plus years as well. So, you know, the cultures really align nicely and they've been fun. And that's part of why you get in this business too, is right. to be fun. And there are some major league teams out there that, um, you know, aren't necessarily as fun to work with and don't love their jobs day in, day out. And, you know, winning is very important. Right. You know, I think the Rockies have a really good balance right now of, you know, they're enjoying what they're doing. They understand they're building towards the future and doing something. They're not going to experience success at the major league level right now. But, you know, the hope is that they will in the future. So it's been a really enjoyable relationship and one that, you know, we're excited. We've got a minimum, what, you know, six more years on that partnership mm-hmm. as well. So uh, we're excited to see how many more Spokane Indians come through and end up in Coors Field. You talked about the proximity um, this year, we were privileged to be able to get a couple of major leaguers uh, here on rehab assignment, and that was not something that that happened in the past. Whether you know affiliated with the Texas Rangers or being in a short season A situation, um, you know, closer to the major leagues, closer to Denver, um, you know, let's throw our guys up there to get their rehab in and get them back to Denver. And I, I think we're going to continue seeing more of that. And part of the reason is the enhancements to the facility. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we noticed before we had the clubhouses that we have now, our players, so non-major leaguers, but our players, you know, they come in 10 minutes before batting practice. You know, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing right. to do. And, you know, the food was in a tent, and it was just no good. Um, you were so sitting on top of each right. other. Yeah, there's just no, nothing. Yeah. And um, so they would show up kind of last minute, get out on the field, and the – vast majority of their time spent at the stadium was on the field mm-hmm. and now we're seeing them show up in the morning you know there's spaces to go and that was without the workout facility too so right. they're going to have even more places to go but they can sit there and look at video now they can you know they can sit and listen to their headphones they can play video games they can do go to different rooms yeah. so that there's right. multiple go rooms to, the to go to the area and hang out yeah, yeah. so it's kind of cool and so you're seeing the you know the players spending more time which I think is a really good sign. You're seeing the coaching staff are there more, which I think is a really good sign. Mm-hmm. I believe that leads to better player development as well. The Rockies roving instructors or their scouts, their professional scouts, we're seeing a lot more of them too, partly, be- again, because we have space and right. there's somewhere to actually they meet. they got an office to set up. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so that's really good, and I think we're, we're seeing more and more interest in the Rockies being in Spokane physically which I think is going to lead to more of those major league rehabbers. So they know when you go to Spokane, you're going to have not only, you know, we've always had a really good operation. We've always had a really good airport, really good town, great mm-hmm. attendance, all those things, those boxes were checked, but the facility was always really tight. Yeah. There's just nowhere to go, nothing to do. Um, but now we're going to have these indoor cages. We're going to have, you know, a indoor workout facility. We're right. going to have, you know, a, a bullpen in the, the indoor facility as well. And all the spaces in the clubhouse, and a dugout <laughs> that, right. that can house an entire team. Right. Uh, so I think all those things are going to lead to not only the Rockies spending more time up here, you know, more time for our players, better player development, but I think you're going to see some you know, major rehabbers come through. And we've had more in the last two years with the Rockies than we had in the 16 years with Texas Rangers. Right. You know, maybe four times as much. Right, right. Um, well, Chris, thanks for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you being our first guest. This is uh, hopefully this went smoothly enough for everybody concerned, and people will want to w- watch this. But I, um, I, re- pre- I appreciate you coming out and, and being my guinea pig. No, absolutely. I was happy when you asked me to come out. I was happy to be the first one out, and 
I thought about this morning. I was like, yeah, Dave's going to treat me like a guinea pig. Sure enough. And you said it. I didn't say it. But yeah. Happy to be here and happy to be part of it and support the show. Awesome. So that's Chris Duff, president of the Spokane Indians. I'm Dave Nichols with the Spokesman Review. This has been the, the Press Box podcast. Uh, we'll, we'll post these episodes every Tuesday. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we hope that you will continue to join us.